Episode 240 of CPP Cast with guests Kevin Cadu and Cybrand, recorded March 26, 2020. Sponsor of this episode of CPP Cast is the PVS Studio team. The team promotes regular usage of static code analysis and the PVS Studio static analysis tool. In this episode, we discuss a new Clang release. Then we talk to Kevin and Sai from the Visual C++ team. They tell us about C++ build insights and other updates in Visual Studio. Welcome to episode 240 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C developers by C developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right, Rob. How are you doing? Doing okay. Um, not too much news to discuss myself. Uh, we're going to agree not to talk about <laughs> the thing already that's going on. Oh, I didn't say it. I didn't say the word. So we're just going to skip over that because I'm sure people don't want to hear us talking about it every week. I do have news that has kind of unofficially official because it is listed on the conference website now mm-hmm. okay. that I will be doing a two-day conference also at NDC Tech Town, which is at the end of August, beginning of September, back in uh, Norway. Awesome. It was Very a cool. few weeks ago that I'm like, no, I don't have any news yet. And then I went to their website and saw that they had posted it. So <laughs> that's great. Okay, well, at the top of the episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, we got a tweet from Peter Van Sent saying, I'd like to recommend John Turner to a CPP cast episode. If you're wondering, I've been doing reruns. Uh, did you reach out to your cousin about this, Jason? Well, I, I referenced him in my response to that tweet, and he didn't respond to me. I'm assuming he's referring to my cousin and referring to what the third episode when I was on and our second episode and discussed. Because he uh, worked on Kai script with you. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, he's been involved in many programming languages at this point. TypeScript and Rust Rust and, yeah. yeah. We should definitely have him on. Nice talk to your cousin. Yeah. Sure. We should, uh, you know, reach out to him if he doesn't respond to that tweet soon. Okay. Okay. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpgas.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Joining us today, we have Kevin Kadu and Cy Brand. Kevin is an engineer on the MSVC backend team working on code generation, optimization, and build throughput. He is the designer and main implementer of C++ Build Insights, the new build analysis platform for the MSVC toolchain. In his spare time, he... Wait, what spare time? Anyway, he likes to play video games and enjoys creative endeavors such as graphic design and writing. And we also have Sai, who is Microsoft C++ developer advocate. Their background is in compiler and debuggers for embedded accelerators, but they're also interested in generic library design, metaprogramming, functional style C++, undefined behavior, and making our communities more welcoming and inclusive. Uh, Welcome to the show, Kevin, and welcome back, Sai. Hey, thanks very much for having me again. Yeah, thanks for having me. So do you like uh, creative writing, short stories kind of thing, Kevin? No, just, I, I guess, technical writing. Oh, I which don't think can technical get, writing is a which hobby. Can get, no, but it can get creative. Like, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Are you playing any good video games, then? I play Overwatch at the moment, typically. I am not. I've never played that. Have you, Rob? Uh, I have not played it, but my son actually just recently got it for his Nintendo Switch. Uh, I should I just, try it out with him. Yeah, I just got a Switch and Animal Crossing, which is an absolute joy in these times. <laughs> I've seen lots of people talking about Animal Crossing online. I have not looked into it too much. Wasn't that like Wii. a Facebook game or something? It was a Wii game. Was it a Wii it? game? Okay. It was on GameCube originally. GameCube. Oh, GameCube. Uh, oh, it was my neighbor playing it on his Wii, which probably was just the GameCube version. That's what I'm thinking of. So is this like a straight port of the old GameCube no, is, or is it updated? This is, yeah, this is brand new. Okay. It's really good. You should get it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like a, I mean, what is the gameplay like? Oh, it's just, it's cutesy, and you're building up an island and making friends. It's just, it's very pure, very sweet. <laughs> <coughs> okay. 
Uh, okay, well, uh, Kevin and Sai, we got some news articles to discuss, and then we'll start talking more about uh, C++ Build Insights and other news from the Visual Studio team, okay? Yeah, sounds good. Sounds okay, good. so this first article we have is uh, Vector of Objects versus Vector of Pointers and Memory Access Patterns. This is from Bartex blog, and uh, yeah, he did some benchmarking here talking about different situations where, you know, the two patterns could be better. So doing a vector of objects can be better for kind of like a random access situation. But if you're sorting, the vector of pointers is actually much faster. <coughs> and there's one yeah. little note here. Copying pointers is faster than copying a large object. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like this article. It's, uh, I think this is a repost of an, an old one he did from like six years ago or something. Like if you look at the, the comments there... They're kind of old, which maybe explains like the he says the you got two point five speed up on um, on the vector access, and that seems a little bit low to me for some things. But then I guess like micro benchmarking stuff when cache access patterns are involved is is really difficult to get uh, solid numbers. But still, I like the way they explained it all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anything you wanted to add to this one, Kevin? Yeah, I think it's uh, the results are interesting. I mean, it's, it's expected because like the pointers are smaller in memory, so sorting them it's typically faster. That's that's what I would have expected. I feel like I'm actually slightly surprised that sorting the shared pointers is faster than sorting the values because copy and assignment on shared pointer is very much not cheap. <clears throat> What By would the time be... you have to do a increment, a reference increment, reference decrement, and then check to see if the results zero and whatever, and you know, it's a bunch of yeah, yeah. yeah. Jason's that... moving them around though. <laughs> I'm curious what your recommendation would be with this. Would do you go vector of objects or vector of pointers, or does it depend on the situation? Are you asking me? Yeah, I don't get asked questions on this show. <laughs> 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 I would always prefer the value of uh, the vector of objects until I had a reason to move to vector of pointers. Although I was just thinking about size comment, and that's correct, I guess. In the sort case, there is no assignment. It's all swaps. So maybe they can avoid the expensive reference increment and decrement. Yeah. Otherwise, it would just completely murder the performance. I, think. I would think so. It'd have to, right? Okay. Okay. Well, this next article we have is uh, the post prog mailing from uh, the ISO group and i'm not sure if there's actually anything new here or if it's kind of just an updated list of what went to Prague, and you can see what was actually adopted and voted in at the Prague meeting is that right or did anyone notice that there were some some new papers in here well i have to say for my part i did not memorize the list of all the no papers no i didn't either <laughs> that's fair uh but uh, some of these things i definitely did not recognize but i don't know how new they were either Although if you look at the dates on them, it looks like most of the dates are before the Prague meetup. So right, yeah, there's just I don't know. so many. This is all out here, days, though. If anyone wants to go back to, to it, track of everything. Yeah. Did you read through any of these, Sire or Kevin? I personally did not, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, an interesting paper here that's called "Throws Nothing Should Be No Except," and it's a discussion of whether or not standard library functions that are currently marked as "throws nothing" should, in fact, actually become specifically no except in the standard and i don't know if it comes to a, a you know whether or not this was accepted but i do find it as an interesting discussion at the very least because i've often wondered that when i'm reading through the standard and you you know if you see no except on the function signature you know it's not going to throw an exception right. otherwise you have to like read all the stuff until you get to the throws oh throws nothing oh okay it doesn't look like this was accepted yet at least not at Prague. okay okay and then the last article we have is that LLVM uh, Clang version 10.0 was released. And some of the highlights were that they managed to get C++ concept support in already. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, this is really great. Actually, uh, one of... Oh, sorry. Please go ahead, sorry. So, yeah, I was just saying that uh, yeah, having another concept implementation is, is really great. We've been shipping Clang and LLVM in VS since, uh, I think, 16.1 with CMake support and then MS build support. And then we've been having like Clang tidy support in there as well. So we're, we're hoping to update to the most recent version as, as soon as we can. Awesome. Yeah. I, uh, like to tell students about control flow guard. Um, a lot of people on windows doing windows development aren't aware of it. And I find it interesting. This is one of the highlights here for Clang 10 is that it supports control flow guard checks as well. Does that, 
I don't know, do either of you, since you're involved in Windows development, have anything to add to that? I do not. <laughs> Sire, <or> Kevin. <laughs> uh, no, I don't really know anything about that. Oh, uh, okay. It's, well, it's, it's my understanding is that it's a, uh, runtime guarantee that if your code, if someone tries to circumvent your code so that it's, um, tries to execute code that should be, uh, not executable, then it's going to throw and then, uh, crash the program. So the operating system will catch it. So it's okay. just one extra little check. It's supposed to be very low overhead. So Microsoft recommends uh, any applications that you ship to users to have Control Flow Guard enabled. Nice. Uh, so like the, it's interesting. They have this uh, new optimization for if you you do pointer arithmetic, which um, moves the pointer outside of an array. That's undefined behavior. And so it's now doing optimizations based on that. I'm hoping this isn't going to be one of those things where it breaks a ton of code and people get angry. But they did add uh, UV sanitizer uh, support to it as well to to catch those cases. So we'll see how that goes. I, I hope it breaks a lot of code and people <laughs> get angry. And then they start using their sanitizers more and they understand why they were doing bad things. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, that is one, one approach to the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's like, I mean, I don't think we've ever discussed this with you on the air, Cy, or definitely not Kevin, but uh, it's come up a couple of times that when GCC implemented or made it default to optimize around uh, checks for this being null, right? that they got just blasted for it. But it has yeah. literally been undefined behavior since day one of C++, but people yeah. relied on broken compilers. Yeah, well, I mean, we've had... Um, somewhat similar issues because you know we've had we've been working so hard on conformance the last few years and of course there's inconsistencies in the old behavior and the new behavior so everything's been behind a switch but yeah getting people to move to the standard behavior not rely on um, on what implementations used to do is is just a, a hard problem yeah yeah Okay, so Kevin, uh, we briefly spoke about some of the blog posts that you did last year, I think around November, uh, about C++ build insights, but we definitely did not dig into it. So could you maybe give us an overview of the tool to start off? Yeah, of course. So C++ build insights is like a, a build analysis a solution that we developed for MSVC. Its uh, its purpose is to help our users understand uh, their build times, basically. And it comes with a tool called vcperf. And the tool is used to collect a trace of your build, which you can then open in uh, WPA, which is uh, the Windows Performance Analyzer. It's like a trace viewer that uh, it's available on Windows to view ETW traces. And when you do that, when you open your trace, like you get that this nice graphical over- overview of your build, and you can immediately like spot uh, bottlenecks and things of that nature. And it also gives you like time information in aggregated form. So what this gives you is like, oh, in your entire build. You parse this header like three thousand times for a total of uh, nine thousand seconds, <laughs> and so and so these are, are very useful because, for example, in the header case, you can use that to optimize your PCH, for example. And so the events that are supported, we have uh, for events for all compiler and linker invocations. We have header parsing, uh, function code generation, and even template instantiations, which is the newest event that we added. Uh, the system is scalable. You can use it on builds that run for many hours. And uh, it's, it's because it's based on ETW, it's very easy to use because the, the collection is managed by the OS itself. So, if I, for example, if you, you can just start a trace and all the events from MSVC running on your system are just collected automatically. You don't have to know, like, like you don't have to use a command line switch, for example, on, on each of your invocations. It's just done automatically. Hmm. So that makes it easier because you don't have to, to, to understand even your build system on how to add switches and stuff. And oh, I also heard uh, like in your episode in November, someone was asking if um, like if VCPerf was backward compatible, basically, like if if they could use it on on older oh, versions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you remember? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And the answer is yes, actually. Like if you, for example, if you download VS 2019 just to get VCPerf, you can actually open a command prompt, uh, like a VS 2019 command prompt, run v- VCPerf and build your project you using VS 2017, for example, and it would still work. But it's only backward compatible down to VS, uh, like d- down to version 15.7, I think, which is s- somewhere in VS 2017. Okay. Okay. And now, I guess, before we get too much further, too, is this available to all users of Visual Studio, or do you need Enterprise or anything like that? It's, uh, it's all users, as far as I know. 
Yeah. Okay. Be because yeah, VC Perf is even is even uh, as of now um, available on GitHub. Oh. So okay. you can clone it, build it, and just run it like as a standalone program, and whichever VS you're using, it's just going to work down to uh, 2017, as I said. I guess it really would not make sense to make it an enterprise only feature if it were open source. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so even if you're just using like the command line Visual Studio build tools, you can uh, install VC Perf and run it that way. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And so that that's what you first announced in November, but then there was an update to this tool just a few weeks ago, right? Yeah. So just a few weeks ago, I, I wrote another blog post which um, basically announced the release of the C++ Build Insights SDK. Uh, because so so the the C plus plus building sites SDK basically takes C plus plus building sites technology and makes it available to everyone so that they can write they can write their own tools with it. Uh, mm. Like VC Perf itself is built using the SDK. Okay. And and so that's the reason we made it open source because we wanted to give an example to people of what they could do with the SDK and 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 one of the reasons we. Um, Open source also, well, one of the reasons you should, everyone listening should, should clone and build VC Perf <laughs> is if they want to, no, seriously, <laughs> because the new events like template instantiations, for now, they're only available uh, in the open source version. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. So the open source has more than what comes packaged in Visual Studio. I mean, the events for, for the template instantiations are, are in their Visual Studio, but the VC Perf that understands them and creates the trace that actually shows them is only available in... Uh, in the open source version for now. Okay. Yeah, these things will make it into into releases, but you know, between releases and things like that, any updates you'll have to get um, on the GitHub. Yeah. Great. Oh, and we we also have um, for the SDK we have like a samples repository on GitHub as well, which will populate over time with more examples and what they can do with the SDK. Okay. So then, who is the uh, intended target audience for this SDK? So one of the reasons, like we did the SDK, is because initially, like we were we were talking to our Xbox partners, and they were telling us that they, they needed a way to, um, like to, to to programmatically kind of analyze their build times in, during their CIs. So that was one of the way that was one of the reasons we did it. Uh, like for example, you could like automatically detect bottlenecks in your builds by consuming the timing information using the SDK. And mm. it, and there's a bunch of other use cases. For example, if you if you don't like WPA. Like, if you don't like viewing your traces in WPA, you can basically use the, the SDK and create your own visualization experience that fits with your own tools. The, okay. The target audience is mostly like build engineers. You know, the, these people in the companies that have, that, that manage and monitor their builds. And if they want to write custom tools that fit their scenarios, it's typically those people who would use uh, the SDK. So do you know if anyone is, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you might not be able to tell us details, but if anyone is already using this for like their build dashboards to show where they have, you know, messed things up in the last check-in or something. I actually don't know that yet. It's okay. too, uh, it's, I think it's too early to tell. Maybe someone's going to come back to us uh, at some point. That would be, I mean, truly That's a really cool idea. Like, you know, if you could have a build fail after a check-in because suddenly parsing all the headers took, you know, 10% longer, you know, that would yeah. be something you want to go yeah. and address right away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And particularly your comment of PCH earlier, I find things like PCH can be a little fragile. I could mm -hmm. easily see that someone could mess something up and accidentally add 20% to the build time on a large yeah. project. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So if anyone listening would like to try it out for their, uh, for analyzing their builds, uh, please feel free to get in touch with us. Yeah, and there's like a full documentation available online, like on docs.microsoft.com. Like all the, all the functions, all the APIs are documented. So it should be simple enough, I think. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I want to interrupt the discussion for just a moment to bring you word from our sponsor. This episode of CPPCast is sponsored by the PVS Studio Company. The company produces the same name PVS Studio Static Code Analyzer that has proved to be great at the search for errors and especially typos. The tool supports the analysis of C, C++, C Sharp, and Java code. The article 012 Freddy's Coming for You, which has been recently posted, clearly demonstrates the analyzer's outstanding abilities of searching typos. The article shows how easy it is to make a mistake, even in simple code, and that no one is immune from making it. You can find a link to the article in the podcast description. There's also a link to the PVS Studio download page. When requesting a license, write the hashtag CPPCast and you'll receive a trial license for a full month instead of one week. 
So I'm, I'm curious about what are some of the other um, situations that VC Perf and, and the Insights SDK might help uh, C++ engineers solve? Like you, you mentioned, uh, you know, cleaning up your, your PCH, optimizing it if uh, certain headers are taking a long time to parse, being parsed lots of times. What are some of the other um, actionable things you might get out of this tool? So the, the top three... Um things that we see the, the first one is the the, the headers honestly okay. uh, i'm gonna repeat it because it's just so common that we see people yeah. finding out oh wow my this header is taking like a whole bunch of time and that's because people before before we had build in size they didn't they just didn't have the information that they needed to know like the aggregated statistics on each header they, they just didn't have that hmm. so i think this is the reason why we're seeing a lot of people like figure out that their headers are, are just wrong <laughs> so <laughs> So that, that's the first one that we see the most often. And the second one is just like bottlenecks. Uh, like the first thing that you see when you open WPA is this graphical view, like uh, like you see like one timeline per thread, basically. So you can easily spot like, oh, let's say you have like one area of your build, which is not parallelized. You're, you're going to see it as just like one line mm -hmm. there. So this way you can easily see, oh, there's something going on there. What is it? And then you can just like drill down and discover, for example, oh, it's because I didn't throw MP, the MP switch uh, on this CL invocation or something. Hmm. Okay. And I'm so, yeah, oh, go ahead. Okay. I'll explain why I'm laughing in a minute. Go ahead and finish yours. Oh, I, I think I know why, but anyway. Uh, and the third one is uh, that we often see is functions. Sometimes functions take a long time to uh, optimize in the optimizer. This can be because either because they're too large or because uh, it's like a... So sometimes the compiler generates like large dynamic initializers that are um, that just take a long time to generate. Like if you have like large like static large arrays, large global arrays with tons of entries, sometimes the optimizer has trouble with that. And so you can spot them. You can spot those in the in the uh, the functions view of WPA. Hmm. We see this uh, quite like it's not uncommon actually. We we often see this. And like like another way that like you get huge functions is, is if you use the force inline keyword too much. Uh, and so everything gets in line it's like a like a huge function and then the optimizer starts to um starts cry. to freak out. Yeah. <laughs> a, uh, so large... I was I would say those are the three most common okay. things that you can do. A large project that I was uh have been working on off and on for the last ten years. Uh it's been a multi-year process for them to split the project into two pieces. And it turns out I was building one of the pieces just two days ago, and it was taking forever to compile on my recently built 12-core machine. And I'm a 12-thread machine, a 6-core. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? And finally realized that, yeah, during the split process, the slash MP flag had not been propagated to the uh, other portion of the library. Oh, yeah, okay, that's not what I imagined. I thought you were going to say something else. <laughs> oh well, what did you think I was going to say? No, never mind. It's better. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> I would love to see, uh, since you're talking about like actionable items, it sounds like with these common use cases that it would be possible for someone to write a tool that says, "Well, we just analyzed your build, and hey, dummy, you forgot to put slash mp, and oh, by the way, you're including the same header file thirty thousand times unnecessarily." Like, is that possible? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's one of the reasons the SDK was created in the first place is to write these kinds of tools. Like and playing in, in tidy fact, for my build system. Oh yeah. Sorry, in, go ahead. In, in fact, like, because I'm gonna write more articles in the future, and like every one of them, most of them is gonna have like like a VC VC perf use case accompanied by the um, appropriate SDK sample that does the same thing. So. Okay. The, like the first blog post that I'm going to post soon is going to be like an example on how to find a bottleneck in in a build using VCPerf and the the build explorer view, like the graphical timelines view. And the sample that comes for that is actually the example that I mentioned. It automatically finds cases where you don't throw MP, and when it's a bottleneck, and and if it if, if it finds it, it's going to emit a warning. Very good. Yeah. Very cool. So uh, this is pretty easy to use. You know, you just open up your Visual Studio command line, run vcperf before and after the build. Um, but are there any plans to bring it fully into Visual Studio? So you could just hit like, you know, build with uh, vcperf or something like that and, and get an output of, you know, what was taking all the time in your build. Sai, do you want to... Yeah, sure. We're, uh, this is something that we're, um, like, we definitely see as a ability going forward. So we're kind of seeing what the adoption is on this tool and uh, how much people 
would like a feature like that. So, um, yeah, if this is something which would be very useful for you, please get in touch or create like a, uh, a ticket on our, our bug track or on developer community. And it'll just help us to prioritize how much work we should be putting into, into this kind of support. Oh, hold on a second. I just have to need to go to the VC website real quick now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually have one suggestion to get for this specifically that someone already posted. Right. It has like, I think, 20 upvotes. So everyone listening, just go there and just like upvote. Oh, maybe I'll find the link in the show notes and, and put it. Absolutely. Yeah. Put a link to that in the show notes. Cause I mean, more accessibility to more tools is, is always yep. better. Although I, so forgive me if I miss this, but is there any downside to running this? Is there any overhead that oh, is great question. noticeable or anything? The overhead is not really large, to be honest. I haven't, I've never seen anything drastic. Even when we have the most uh, verbose events, like template instantiations, the overhead like is within noise. Okay, very good. I found it. I'll put this in the show notes. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, Sai, speaking of uh, Visual Studio proper, uh, are there any recent announcements uh, for Visual Studio 2019 or VS Code that you wanted to share? Yeah, sure. We've been doing a lot of work. In fact, we've had um, 16.5 just got released uh, last week, and that comes with a few cool features like uh, team training for IntelliCode. The IntelliCode is our uh, machine learning-driven... Uh, tuning mechanism for IntelliSense. So it's like, you know, if, you, uh, if you're if you doing a bunch of stuff with, with iterators, <coughs> then if you type dot .begin on something, then probably you're going to be typing dot .end on it later on, or something like that. Um, so we've, we've trained this model on a large set of open source code bases to get it to understand, you know, what kind of coding patterns are there in C++, what kind of member functions are you going to be using um, shortly after each other, so that when you have IntelliSense and you, you get that list of member functions, the ones you're going to be most likely to use will be right at the top. And so what 16.5 comes with is the ability to train your own models on your own code bases, so that you know if you have your own, um, if your team has like a set of idioms they use a lot, or certain programming styles, then you can kind of capture that in your, in your model, and it will tune IntelliSense for you, which is really cool. Um, it also comes with, uh, you know, if you use IntelliSense with the standard library, sometimes you get massive type names. So we've, yeah. we've improved those a bit, so you, you should be able to read those a bit better now. Uh, another good one is uh, file copies for, for CMake. Um, if you're doing remote uh, programming, then we, we've optimized those copies so that it's, it's not doing any unnecessary copying of files. Uh, today, which will be... I guess is it this episode going out tomorrow? Yeah, in which yeah, case, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yesterday, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we released uh, sixteen point six preview two, uh, which comes with a few cool things like uh, better Ninja support for CMake on Linux. So Ninja is now the the default underlying generator when you're building uh, on WSL or remote Linux instead of uh, Make files. Uh, we've also added some. Uh, simplified the templates for debugging CMake projects on Linux because you previously had to do a bunch of of your own work to get that all all set up, so we've made that easier. Uh, we also added better Doxygen comment generation in Visual Studio, hmm. and uh, even a IntelliSense code linter, which you can uh, which you can try out. In terms of um, of the the language, the conformant preprocessor is now complete. What? So, yeah. Hasn't that, like, been an open feature request for, like, 25 years or something? That has been, yes. This has been a, <laughs> a, a blocker in a lot of things. A lot of people have been asking for it. So, yeah, those two, the main features are, you know, C++20's uh, VA opt thing, which is, like, a um, for for doing handling variadic macros where some things are optional, and mm. the other one is the the underscore pragma, which we've had um, uh, a feature which looks kind of like it for for a long time, but it's not been the same thing. So now underscore pragma is is supported. Uh, so this is no longer an experimental feature. Uh, you can go ahead and and try it out. And yes, I'm really pleased about that. That's, is this, uh, sorry, go ahead, Jason. No, it's all right. 
Uh, I was just going to say, I'm guessing the, the new preprocessor is still optional, or is it going to become the default? Um, it will become the default. I think it's still under a switch. Okay. But, uh, there's there's going to be, by the time this episode comes out, there will be a blog post uh, which explains everything. Uh, so I've got a question about this IntelliCode thing, which I, I've had enabled, although I haven't really seen the difference on my code bases. So, uh, to be honest, I don't spend a ton of time in the Visual Studio IDE either. But forgive my ignorance with machine learning. My understanding is that machine learning can pick up bad habits also. So is it possible to accidentally train your IntelliCo- IntelliCode to propagate bad practices? I mean, it... If you're if you're training your own models, then you then yes, <laughs> yeah. If you have bad practices already, then uh, that's what machine learning is going to pick up. You know, the whole garbage in, garbage out. Thing. <laughs> so yeah, be selective about what you're training this stuff on. If you want it to pick up the best practices, then train it on code which has your best practices. Is it possible to go in and tweak it, and if it's recommending something, say, no, never recommend this ever again, please? I'm not sure about that off the top of my head. Um, okay. That would be a, yeah, kind of like, on on Twitter, you could be like, I don't like this recommendation. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so maybe we could have, <laughs> have something like this. That's a good question, though. Uh, how granular uh, is it when you tell it to train on some of your code? Like, are you telling it to train on all the code in a Visual Studio solution or in a specific project? Can you tell it, you know, don't ignore all the, or just ignore all the code in this folder? I know it's bad. I think for, for that one, I'll have to defer to, to documentation okay. I off the top of my head. I want one that says, if git commit user equals Bob, ignore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that would, that'd be bad. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, on the VS Code side, um, since last time we spoke, which I guess was uh, CBPCon, no, CBPCon, yeah, yeah, we've had uh, find all references support in in VS Code for C plus plus, which is yeah, you know, one of those features which people mm. were were constantly asking for, and is really great to have in there. Uh, symbol based renaming, so you know, it's not just based on on text. We're actually using uh, an mm. understanding of the the symbols in your code base in order to do this this rename it's like a semantic renaming rather than just token based um, localization support for um, for the actual IDE tooling so you know, if you're um, if you want your your interface to not be in English then that's supported now um, a big one was uh, we took on maintenance of the CMake tools extension so that was previously um, written maintained by uh, Vector of Bool. We oh. did a oh. fantastic job on it, but um, wanted to to hand over control to someone else. So uh, we've taken the maintenance of that on, and uh, we're still, you know, taking. It's still very much a community project. It's we're we're not like taking it and not letting anyone touch it. We're still taking, um, you know, PRs and issues and um, trying to run it the same way as it as it always was, but you know, make sure it's the the highest quality it can possibly be. So. Um, some of the things which have been added since then have been uh, support for multi-root workspaces. So if you have um, like multiple root CMake, um, CMake list files in your repository, then that's now supported. And uh, the other one is the file-based API for CMake. So you know, if tools need to um, extract information about the build from CMake, uh, they used to use the CMake server, but it was really slow. So they added a, a new interface, and now um, VS Code uses that interface. So um, if you're like loading up a, a CMake project and um, populating all of the information, you should notice that that's a lot faster now. That's interesting, because I believe the most recent release notes for CLion made the same change with their CMake handling as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely it, it's a noticeable improvement. So I'm curious, with all these features that you're adding to uh, VS Code, like where is its place in the Visual Studio ecosystem? It seems like it's almost becoming as featureful as Visual Studio. Yeah, well, we still want to maintain that feeling that you know VS Code is a little bit more um, lightweight for people who who prefer that kind of environment. We still like when we're making recommendations to people, we still if you're on Windows, Visual Studio should be your your go to tool. Um, 
and then Visual Studio Code is what we recommend for for Linux and and Mac. Uh, you know, they, yeah, as you say, there are a lot of new features being added to VS Code, but we're trying not to um, to change it in such a way that it's uh, unrecognizable. You know what I mean? Right. It should still be that that same kind of style of code editor, um, but just have all of these extra niceties like the semantic renaming, reference finding, things like that. I have to give it a try again. I haven't in a while. Yeah, please do. Let me know how it goes. All right. Um, do you have any timeline on when MSVC might be C++ 20 feature complete? I know the, the ink's not fully dry yet, but... Yeah, I mean, we we can't make any promises at this time, but we're, we're working really hard on it. Um, we've got you know, the concepts and spaceship operator now uh, feature complete in the compiler, um, of proteins. both concepts and feature uh, and spaceship feature complete is that what you just said? Yeah, the the spaceship operator, the library stuff is still in progress, but oh, okay um, for the compiler, yes. Uh, All right, and then we're working hard on coroutine support and um, and modules. The standard library has been ever since Visual Studio twenty nineteen came out. We've had more and more features every release for C plus plus twenty. Um, we're doing the or const expert algorithms and span for the most recent release um, is constant mm. evaluated, uh, std erase if things like that. Um, so we're, if everything goes well, we might have um, feature complete by the the end of the year. But um, there are no promises yet. We we have to see how how things go. All right. That's I'm good. curious about your updates to uh, coroutines because it seemed like I don't know. Again, I've not really been following coroutines very closely, but like a year ago, all the compilers like, oh yeah, we've got coroutines. And now if I look at the standards conformance page on Compiler Explorer, uh, Explorer, excuse me, Compiler Conformance page on CPP Reference, that's what I was trying to say, um, everyone's like, no, we don't have full support for coroutines. I don't know what you're talking about. And like, did I, did I miss something or is my memory like tainted? Yeah, I haven't been following um, coroutines as, as much. Uh, we have been um, getting that we we're working towards uh, a complete implementation as as soon as we can. Uh, it's not quite there yet. Okay, another thing I need to spend time with. Uh, I know you mentioned a couple things about the uh, VS twenty nineteen preview build. Is there anything else uh, upcoming that you can tell us about? We should be looking forward to. Um, I think I mentioned um, all the one the main ones which are in. Uh, 16.5 and 16.6 preview 2. Uh, you can go ahead and look at the uh, the release notes for 16.6 preview 2 should be out um, by the time this episode is, so you can you can go ahead and read more details there. Uh, it was 16.5 uh, release notes are already out, so they have have more details about everything which which came in that release. Um, as far as things which are coming up, you know we're always working on conformance. We're Working more on um, on our CMake support for um, for both Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. Uh, so yeah, just keep your eyes open for our our blog posts and release notes, and they'll they'll keep you up to date. Right. Okay. Uh, one other thing I will um, mention is um, we've been working really hard on um, it. You know, build imp- build speed improvements have been really high on our, our priorities. You know, we've got our, our build insights tool, but also. Um, just in terms of the the tool chain in general, so we've been working really hard on the improving the linker throughput and um, all the way end to end from the the front end of the compiler right to to the linker. Um, and we're seeing build improvements anywhere from like fifteen to forty five percent on on large industrial code bases like uh, AAA video games, C plus plus Win RT, all these kinds of things. So. If you if you're still on um, an older version of the tool chat of the tool set, then I would highly recommend upgrading if you can. We're still ABI compatible back to um, 2015. So if you're if you're using the 2015 tools, then we will still <coughs> link against any of your dependencies, and you should hopefully see massive build improvements. So wow. um, yeah. Please let us know if you have any success stories or uh, or any problems as well. Because if, if we've interest, if we've added any regressions or anything, we'd we'd love to hear about that. But yeah, also successes are good. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. 
That's, I mean, that's great because so often you hear people, oh, well, we, you know, we just don't have a compelling business reason to upgrade our compiler. And I try to get to, you know, a better optimizer, you know, better warnings. But I like the idea of being able to say, you know, maybe upwards to 50% build improvement or something, you know, just that that would be helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, if people even just give it a shot and uh, time their build, run build insights on it and, uh should see those those numbers the even in terms of runtime as well like we've been working hard on the auto vectorizer um avx2 support uh avx 512 support um just getting more and more vectorization op- opportunities um better optimizations in in a number of areas so there there will be blog posts coming about uh back-end improvements as well in in the coming weeks awesome very cool okay uh, Jason, you have anything else you want to go over? I think it covers it for me. Okay, Sai or Kevin, anything else you wanted to share before we let you go? I think that covered everything that I wanted to talk about. Yeah, nothing for me, really. Just go try Build Insights. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm yeah, definitely going to check build it insights out. <laughs> and uh, try the most recent updates. Try the, the preview. Um, let us know if you have any feedback. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming on the show again, Sai and Kevin. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for having us. See ya. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. We'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let us know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, we'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. We'd also appreciate if you can like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at Left to Kiss on Twitter. We'd also like to thank all our patrons who help support the show through Patreon. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash cppcast. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com. Website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode was provided by podcastthemes.com.